כן, זה לא מוזר. נכנסיים שלי. לא. היי רבאלי, הלו נוגה! It's over. It's over, but it, in, it was really, the way I did it, it was really like season 8. It was yeah. out of tune, completely. <laughs> 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 completely. <laughs> so, welcome to another On the Couch video for Game of Thrones. And this, this time we want to look back at the major psychoanalytical themes of the story. Not just in season 8, maybe even mostly not on season 8, about the entire story. A fantasy land in a civil war with monsters coming in from the north. What's to psychoanalyze in that? Everything. Ooh, boom, start, please. The story begins with the awakening of the White Walkers, right? First scene. At, at the beginning, it seems like something is bubbling, you know, underground. This kind of darkness is lurking and we still don't know what it is. But we can see the awakening of the White Walkers as parallel to uh, the wars on the crown. I mean, there's been a relative silence for a while. Right. There's a war coming, Ned. I don't know when, I don't know who we'll be fighting. But it's coming. The death instinct, the, the instinct that leads us to this kind of like a homeostasis, but before that we must, you know, ruin everything that's in our way. Why, what is it, this instinct? Freud, uh, he talked about two major instincts. The first one being the life instinct, the, the eros, the thing that uh, drives us towards life, uh, towards uh, sexuality, creativity, okay. bonding with other people, etc. This is like the major force uh, of uh, eros is uh, the libido. Doing things. Doing things and like from a very instinctual way, you okay. know, things that are basically sexual are sublimated into things that are uh, more culturally acceptable. And uh, then during the First World War, Freud didn't understand, you know, why people yes. uh, kill each other. Yeah, everybody went happily to the war. Yeah. First people, World War. Exactly, yeah. and he was amazed by that because uh, his, all, his whole theory was, you know, that we're motivated by the pleasure principle. We want things to be pleasurable and we don't want things to be hurtful, uh, dangerous, etc. And then suddenly there's this kind of like, you know... Yes, everybody's celebrating. Yay, going to war, going to war. Really, I mean, he was like, what? You okay, know, he was, he was really scared that his theory might not be true. <laughs> so he came up with another instinct. He said there's also the death instinct, the Thanatos. Thanatos. Yes. Both instincts, they complement each other. Eros drives us towards life, Thanatos towards dead, death. And basically, it's a, a death is homeostasis. We want to be in a situation where, where we don't want anything. Like nirvana. That's yeah, also well, yeah, that's one also, uh, exactly. representation of that. Exactly. Or whatever. Sometimes you just like look out the window, mm -hmm. out the balcony, and you're like, not for any whatever rational reason or just like a mood. You're just like, what if I just like end everything? You think this is like a common experience of people of like a... No, you know, whatever in New York, in the subway, you see the subway and you think like, what if I jump? No? No, it is a, it, it is a very <laughs> common thought. <laughs> it is a very common thought and, and it's like, uh, <laughs> but it's not from, uh, but it, it's, exa it's exactly from that. It's not from a, a wish to die. But like uh, the, also the, the joy of overcoming the fear of death. Like when oh. you say, okay, so if I jump right now, you know, nothing will actually happen. Right, I mean, because I, you can't imagine. You can't imagine it, but you're also not devastated by the thought. So it's very liberating in that sense. Uh. It's like you conquered the fear of death or something. But okay. we're going back to Westeros. I know okay. that you've drifted away from <laughs> Sorry, that. I wanted to talk about myself. Yeah. So uh, we can see the White Walkers as a kind of like a symbol to the death instinct. They were dormant for a while and then suddenly war was coming and uh, winter was coming as well. I mean, the, the Yeah, winter is also death, nature's death. Exactly. It's uh, death and then uh, being reborn and the circle of life, blah, blah, blah. Right. And the Night King supposedly symbolized death. Yeah. They raised dead people. Yeah. 
So, but it is like the death instinct. I mean, they don't want anything but the homeostasis, right? That's what we learned, that all they want is to, yes. you know. <laughs> we know th so much about them right now. And, uh, you know. So, so they were awakening mm -hmm. as the old rifts in the kingdom were also awakening, right? So 15 years of peace after a tumultuous period, but not everything is uh, something is rotten in the kingdom of uh, Denmark Westeros mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. as this is waking up also the human ability to kill each other is also waking up mm -hmm. and into the story a few seasons into the story the white walkers are ravaging the north mm -hmm. and the kingdom is ravaging each other and humans exactly. are ravaging each other yeah i mean we don't need the white walkers to ravage each other right i mean that's what they're telling us i mean we're right. doing a, quite a good job ourselves because the death instinct is not something external to us. Now to a dire warning about climate change. Cars and homes were washed away. I don't know that it's man-made. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Uh, man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Warnings of impending climate disasters. Oh. Growing in urgency. Heavenly Father, please help us. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate the way these scientists are portraying it. Grumpkins and snocks and all the other monsters your wetness warned you about. All of this with the global warming and that, and a lot of it's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? So uh, that was Freud, and Freud was basically much more libidinal in that sense. Like libidinal? Yeah, like he thought everything, you know, it was related to sex. I mean, everyone knows that about Freud. That's like the basic concept. The cave is the vagina. The building is the phallus, this and that. Cigar, the cigar. The cigar is just a cigar. The cigar I mean, is the only <laughs> thing that is just a cigar. The cigar is the only thing. Yeah, exactly, because it's Freud. So, yeah, it's Freud, yes. Klein put much more of an emphasis on the death instinct. She thought that uh, we're very aggressive in nature. I mean, that it's not our sexuality that needs to be repressed, but it's the, the death instinct, like our own aggression, and, and okay. then we're trying to preserve our own sense of goodness, and we're willing that we to... we are good? That we are good, and we're willing to do anything in our power to prove that we're good. I mean, and basically what we do is we uh, deny the parts of ourselves that are aggressive and bad, we split them, we project them into others, okay. and then we see the others as purely bad and see ourselves as purely good because if we're devoid of all those bad things then we must be purely good and it's all about purity here I mean it's very important you can't be both and you can't be both good and bad so the others the white walkers are in the books called the others mm -hmm. so the, so we are projecting all the bad things in humanity on them mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we can see that with groups but we can also see that with people I mean, sometimes when you see people argue very passionately about things, what they're basically saying, you know, if we could dub their unconscious, is like, you're bad, I'm good, you're bad, I'm good, you're bad, I'm good. And it's like th this whole process of just struggling really hard to preserve that sense of goodness. Fuck you! And it's so difficult if, if someone, you know, shows us a mirror of ourselves that we're not that good. There are characters that we connect to more because they either remind us of ourselves or they bring up something that we would want to have and we would want to have through unity with that character, certain kind of attributes. We want, you know, the characters sometimes to have a certain type of agency that we can't have for ourselves and then through them we feel empowered or I thought that Daenerys was really you know she was just very feeble I thought she was just like one of those characters that you know you just feel sorry for them and then it's tragic because something happens to them and uh, then when she started Go Axios and us, 
Kiloni pilos lue vale tolvio zinatas. Ininini odrikatas. Urne lue tolde prijatas. There was something much more liberating about it because... Dracaris. And we were like, oh, I want to be like her. Mm -hmm. We can feel all kinds of things. I mean, we can, you know, take all kinds of bits and pieces unconsciously, of course, and we go through some kind of process with them. The fact that they're so diverse, it brings us more parts of the whole. And right. sometimes we push ca some characters away. We dislike certain characters because they remind us of parts of ourselves that we, we dislike. And that would be treason. Trees disobeying your queen's command, fighting with her enemies, what would you call it? And also Cersei, we mentioned it oh, in our episode. In the Thrones Effect. The chapter. In the chapter, sorry. The Thrones Effect. We co-wrote an episode, I wrote another episode, then I edited chapter. the whole thing, sorry, a chapter. <laughs> And uh, you have, there's a link in the description. You can get it uh, in a physical book or audio book or ebook. It's basically a collaboration between all kinds of YouTubers and us and, and also Theo Ganji, a novelist, to encapsulate everything that is good and fine and pure in Game of Thrones, not what is well, all the bad things that are over there. The good things are over here. So we mentioned here Cersei mm -hmm. ha, as an example of someone, okay, she wants to sit on the throne. She, she's ambitious. Okay, but you explain that in psychoanalysis we look for the hidden motives beneath the ground. Mm -hmm. And in this case, to be safe. The people who are safer are the ones that are male, that have a penis, right? So penis envy comes into action, like Freud, you know, Freud would love that. But uh, uh, Lacan, he... Uh, Jacques. Mean, Jacques, that's right. Uh, he uh, basically said, look, it's not the organ itself, right? It's not the penis. Okay. It's the phallus. It's the phallus envy, basically. Which is? The, the phallus is like an erected penis. That's like the, I mean... That's lingam. Like, yeah, the lingam. <laughs> the lingam, okay. <laughs> so, but it's not real. Never mind, it's like a different... Uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it signifies power, not, not the organ itself, like the, you know, like the power of uh, the penis, or the power right. of uh, being uh, like in a powerful position right. in society. It could be like also skin color or any other common denominator of a population that has power. Right, exactly. So you want that, you envy that. Not because you necessarily want to be uh, uh, wider, uh, right. uh, browner, whatever. You want that power that is right. affiliated with that kind of quality. Right. And people see that power in all kinds of ways. Some people see certain kinds of power in having a darker skin because it makes you, in some people's ideas, cooler, more interesting, more edgy. Yeah. And being white is being boring, let's say. So you want that power. Yeah, even uh, you want, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, bigger breasts or like uh, blonde hair, you know. Okay, if so you why? you paid me more. <laughs> <laughs> so why, w so if you want that, it's because you believe, not you. Not me. You believe that this is a, this is a symbol of power. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah, it's a, I mean, we envy things that, uh, you know, make people less vulnerable. If I have this and that, if I have a beautiful car or whatever, then I will be less vulnerable, I will be more wanted, I will, you know, other people will be envy of me. And this also so goes, it goes also to the death principle if we connect it to Buddhism. It's like the, uh, the constant wanting and wanting and wanting, the only way to get there is to start a war. Is that no, Buddhism? I don't think so. Maybe I skipped a few pages to extinguish exactly. the flame. Sorry, this is the conclusion of the of Game of Thrones. I found some I found something good in the conclusion of Game of a Thrones. A Buddhist uh, notion in Game of Thrones. Just extinguish all the ambition. Mm -hmm. You have the guy, the most Buddhist guy, is in Nirvana. Yeah. He doesn't want anything. Completely Zen. And and now this is the solution mm -hmm. to the problem. So the death instinct. Basically, one over, and now 
the realm is dead, but in homeostasis, yeah, homeostasis. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I would have preferred an ending when you know the death. I mean, that the, the White Walkers would just retreat back to the background, and then the darkness would still be lurking. I mean, uh, you know, saying something about uh, a lingering uh, pathogenic uh, factor in humanity, and the fact that they were extinguished is kind of like you know. I mean, yeah, it's not realistic. It's not realistic. I mean, everything was realistic, but that part, you know, it's a part. And so there was another really, really uh, interesting thing that, uh, that you mentioned here, that how come so many people follow these characters so closely and were so enamored with them, even though they're going through the most horrible things in the world? Are we, like, uh, masochistic? Do we want to follow characters who go through rape and they lose their family and their captives and they have and their refugees it's a horrible story how come it's not as heavy as it should be if you just like go through the list of everything bad that has happened to every character it's just horrible please explain so, so one of the things that allow us to connect to these characters is basically the distance. I mean, uh, paradoxically, we connect through a certain kind of distance. Uh, what do you mean by distance? The fact that uh, these characters are so different from us in their lifestyles and, you know, the era in which they live in, like the world, the, the fantasy world, world, the magic world, as opposed to, you know, the real world. If there weren't magic in the world, in this world, and it wasn't a fantasy world, we would have a harder time connecting to these characters? Yeah, I think so. That's kind of anti-intuitive a bit. Think about two objects, uh, or like links in the chain. They need to be separate in order to connect. Uh, if they're not separate, then they're just fused together, and then they become one. And then it's too threatening. You have to distance yourself in order to, uh, you know, to re-individuate yourself. Right, so it's a we, space. We need some space in order to connect. So this kind of distance that the fantasy allows us, on the one hand, we don't feel like they're going through exactly the same things that we are going through, of course, but... Our they, father didn't put us on trial for murdering our nephew, even though we didn't do it. Yeah, but he did put us on trial on other things, right? Like, uh, so through that we can connect to those places. Because but smaller, but, but our dad just maybe said, why didn't you wash the dishes or mow the lawn? It's not a super dramatic things for most people. Yeah, but uh, if he said it in like, a, you know, a ridiculing way or like a, in a way that put us down, then it, it's, or we felt guilty for it or we felt bad or whatever, then it's the same kind of idea. And, uh, and we can project uh, and connect to those characters through that. If they were living in uh, New York or London and, you know, you, you just saw a bunch of people getting uh, raped. raped and uh, ass kicked. <laughs> stabbed in the eye and kids burning, oh, sacrificed then. You know, they just went to church and not, you know, the red. Uh, you and then they got exploded. Yeah. No. 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 You know, like, like, like there was the show, one of my favorite shows of all time, uh, Six Feet Under. Some people felt it was too tragic and... Too morbid. Too morbid. Why do people have to die? And it wasn't just, not even 1% of the tragedies that happened in Game of Thrones. Exactly. But this was like contemporary Los Angeles. <laughs> father is dead so it's harder that's your point right mm -hmm. so we need the space in order to connect to connect to project mm -hmm. to safely safely exactly project Pro safely project safely connect to the characters without thinking that they threaten our own right. lifestyle too right. much it's not us it's a different kind of uh, setting it's a different kind of lifestyle Okay, I think we could, we could go on and on about every single character. And, uh, and we did. And we did. Not every single character. Every single character. We, we have a few characters that we haven't uh, put on the couch yet. yet. And we will eventually. 
-hmm. eventually. But our next uh, videos would, will be about Quentin Tarantino movies. And we're going to psychoanalyze and put on the couch, I'm hoping, uh, Vito Corleone and Michael Corleone. You said you're hoping. I mean, uh, why not just, you know, be more Daenerys about it and just, you know, just take it, you know, don't hope for it. I tricked you, we're going to shoot them now! Oh, no, no, no! <laughs> it's midnight, we're going to shoot them now! No, but I was working all day. Dracarys! Okay, thank you, no God. Thank you, everybody, for watching. You might watch uh, more videos later in this set, but this is the last video in this set. I'm moving in two days, so there's going to be a different set very, very, very soon. This is a great opportunity to thank my patrons, our patrons, for supporting our work. Boom, boom, boom. You're welcome. Right, thank you. This is how we met also. Mm-hmm. How I met your patron. This could be a show TV yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, subscribe to get all our videos. And it's best if you click the, the bell so that way you won't miss any of our videos because YouTube doesn't always show the recommendation in the recommendations our videos. So be sure to click the bell. Thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you all next Bye. time. Bye everybody. Thank you for watching that video. I hope you enjoyed it. You know what I hear most often from new patrons coming into our Patreon page is that they've been enjoying God Academy videos for a long time and that they're happy that they finally can support the channel. So you too can be happy. Happiness is just around the corner. It's on patreon.com slash God Academy. Bliss. Just one cup of coffee a month. Come on. I like coffee.